Good. Then let's go on with the lecture a little bit. The last point that we did the last time was, I think, to derive the form of the 10 uh, currents which are conserved because of Poincaré invariance in the scalar field theory. And let me just... Oh, uh, okay, wrong already. Where is it that we did? Right, I think we wrote down the 10 conserved currents. Uh, one of them was called T rho mu, where mu runs from 0 to 3, and those are four conserved currents for translational invariance. And the formula was, uh, let me not write the formula, and the other one was M rho mu nu, which are six conserved currents for Lorentz invariance in the scalar field theory. And uh, the thing I want to add here, uh, we had the explicit representations of those quantities, but what we didn't yet have was that m rho mu nu actually satisfies a nice relationship to uh, this energy momentum tensor, namely x mu times t rho nu minus x nu times t rho mu, which reminds you of the angular momentum operator compared to the momentum operator. But here it's on the level of the conserved currents. And then I just want to add the full momentum operator, P mu, or the conserved charges, if you want, the conserved charges, the conserved quantities, because of translational invariance, which are in each case given by the D3x integral of the zero component of the conserved current. So that is this. This is our definition of the momentum, the conserved momentum for each direction in space and time. And if we plug in the expression from the last time for the T, then we find an expression for this conserved quantity, the momentum, which is phi dot times d mu phi minus g zero mu times L. And that is an expression for the momentum, first of all, on the classical level. And we know that if we plug in field equations, then this quantity is time independent. But that is, of course, also a quantity that we can use in the quantum theory. When we plug in here quantum field operators, then we get an operator expression, which we would define as the momentum operator in our quantum field theory by the correspondence principle. So just one simple remark in the quantum theory. <coughs> we make this Hermitian. Uh, by uh, replacing this phi dot d mu phi by one half phi dot d mu phi plus d mu phi phi dot. Because that for sure is Hermitian, whereas uh, the single term might not be Hermitian if these two operators do not commute. But on the classical level, that is of course identical. And if we replace the second line by quantum operators, then we manifestly get a Hermitian expression. And then we have an expression for potential uh, momentum operators in our quantum theory, which might have uh, good and useful properties. And you see, if you plug in uh, P0, mu equals zero, then you would get the energy operator in your quantum theory. And uh, plugging in zero gives you phi dot square minus the Lagrangian. And that is the Hamiltonian density from the Legendre transformation. Therefore, this P0 reproduces the Hamiltonian defined by the Legendre transformation as defined by the Legendre transformation. So you see that it fits. We have a full circle here of definitions and relationships. And the same can be done for angular momentum and boosts. We have here g 
JMU new. The conserved quantities corresponding to that current, conserved quantities corresponding to angular momentum and boost, which is the d3x integral of m0 mu nu. And the explicit result is then d3x. And here I simply use that relation because it looks much nicer. x mu t0 nu minus x nu t0 mu. Then you can plug in uh, the full expression and then you get an integral representation of angular momentum, which is conserved on the classical level by equations of motion, but where you can plug in operators by a canonical quantization. And then you have a, um, uh, uh, a proposal for angular momentum and boost operators in your quantum field theory. So and that is what I want to discuss now. And let us uh, spend a few moments on discussing the quantum level properties. of those operators and then thereby of the entire theory that we have defined in this way. Because remember the last time we have uh, created a quantum field operator, then we have uh, created creation annihilation operators A and A dagger, which create one particle states and multi-particle states. And the question that we still had was, uh, what do we actually know about the momentum and energy of those particles? What do we know about the spin of those particles? Now we have momentum operators and angular momentum operators with well-defined expressions. So we can act with those well-defined operators onto our one particle states and see whether they are, they are eigenstates with certain eigenvalues. And in this way, we obtain uh, really as an outcome of the calculation all the properties of our particles in the theory. So first we define P mu and J mu nu as operators by replacing phi goes to phi hat in all those expressions. And phi hat and uh, the momentum pi hat satisfies commutation relations. And then I will just now list five items with properties that you can all establish uh, in ways like we have done just now in the exercise. So P mu and J rho sigma, they are now operators. They satisfy certain commutation relations uh, and which commutation relations do they satisfy? Of course, they satisfy exactly the commutation relations of the Poincaré representation. For example, they satisfy this uh, commutation relation between j mu nu and j rho sigma is given by those four terms which are totally anti-symmetric in the indices. Satisfy the commutation relations of uh, Poincaré representation. And therefore, we can use them as infinitesimal uh, operators uh, for infinitesimal Lorentz transformations and translations. And by combining infinitesimal transformations, we can construct an operator U of lambda and A also for finite Lorentz transformations and for finite tra uh, translations. So we have defined in this way an operator U of lambda and A on our Hilbert space of states. Uh, as a representation. So this U of lambda A automatically satisfies the representation property because the P's and J's satisfy the representation property. Then next, the operator P and J, they are Hermitian.
Even if it's not completely obvious, we can always make them Hermitian by such a simple replacement rule. And uh, therefore, if they are Hermitian, the representation U of lambda and A for the finite transformations is then unitary. So, all in all, this defines us a unitary representation of Poincaré on our Hilbert space of states, and therefore we have now really properly uh, relativistically invariant quantum theory. Because the existence of a unitary representation is the defining property. We can evaluate more commutational relations, for example here such an infinitesimal Poincaré transformation, I epsilon mu P mu, minus i over 2 omega rho sigma j rho sigma. So that was this infinitesimal part of a Poincaré transformation, u of lambda and a. We can do a commutator of that with a quantum field operator, phi hat of x. So you can evaluate the commutator here explicitly because you know everything, how that is composed of fields and momenta, and you know the commutation relations between fields and momenta. So that is it's completely known. And the outcome is epsilon mu plus omega mu nu x nu times d mu phi of x. Okay. So you get this prefactor. And if you look at this, then this is just the infinitesimal version of what we had in the exercise a few minutes ago. And also the uh, version of the question by Matthias. So he has asked this question that derailed the solution of the exercise. And so what I was going to say before I stopped myself was exactly that, because that is what your question would have led to commutator, uh, so this thing here. If you work that out infinitesimally, you get this commutator. And uh, the right hand side is this, and so you get here that this was in, in that case, you would let me write it in the same way as in the exercise lambda x plus a, and here phi of x. So you need to evaluate this commutator and then just by uh, combining it to finite quantities, you get a lower relationship and that means that our field operator phi uh, is a scalar field operator. Where scalar field operator by definition means this equality here. So, and I would say, let me give you just a small glimpse of the proof. Of course, there are many commutational relations, but let's maybe just look at one of them. For example, commutator of P1 times J12. Okay, this would be one commutation relation out of uh, many that I have now alluded to. If we want to evaluate this commutation relation, what do we need to do? We need to copy from the upper blackboard the definition of P1, which is the upper box, and J12, which is the lower box, specifically for some indices. Then we get here a double integral, D3x and D3x prime. And in the commutator for P1, we have the following. We have phi dot, uh, D1 phi, and uh, the arguments are always x uh, prime here, and then we have uh, x1 <coughs> phi dot d2 phi minus x2 phi dot d1 phi. And here the arguments are always x. Okay, and then you know phi dot is equal to
to the momentum operator pi, and you know the commutation relation between phi and pi is i times a three-dimensional delta function between the arguments. So those commutators are either zero or give a delta function that gets rid of one of the integrals and makes all the arguments equal. And then you need to watch out how this d1 sometimes acts onto the x1 to give a one as a result. And then you get one as a result. And so the only uh, term which does not vanish from the commutator is this, where d1 hits the x1. And what remains? What remains is the phi dot from here and uh, the d2 acting on phi here. So all in all, you get d3x times a factor i from one of those commutators times d2 phi. Uh, times phi dot, and that is then really equal to i times the momentum operator P2. And so you can derive in this way that this commutator is equal to i times P2, and that is the correct result, which verifies the Poincaré representation property. And you need to do that, of course, for all indices or for general indices, and you need to do it for P with P, P with J, J with J, and then also between p with phi, j with phi, and all those commutation relations work in the same way. So this is just one illustration. Or a question to this? Would you know how to go on? Yes? Could you explain once more um, what's with this pi? Yeah. Uh, the pi is this canonical conjugate momentum which was defined like this, pi is equal to dl derivative with respect to phi dot. And if you remember, l had this term, d rho phi times d rho phi. So it contains phi dot square minus something else uh, times one half. This is in the Lagrangian, so if you take this derivative, the result is phi dot. And so that was the relation which we derived on Monday, that the canonical momentum pi here is equal to phi dot. And on the quantum level, this is an identity between operators. So the operator phi dot in the quantum theory is identical to the operator pi. And in the quantum theory, then we have this canonical commutation relation. This commutator here between a variable and the canonical momentum is equal to i times a three-dimensional delta function between the arguments at the same time. And that is what you can use in evaluating the commutator. Because the only things that appear here are phi and phi dot. And commutator of phi with phi gives zero, commutator of phi with phi dot gives i times the delta function. And so using this, you can evaluate step by step all these commutators. Other questions? So it's just important that you would know how to go on, and then with some effort, you can do all the commutation relations. But what is also important for us is uh, not only to be technically able to do the commutation relations, but also to understand what they mean. And they mean all these important things. In particular, I repeat, we have defined a unitary representation of the Poincaré group on our Hilbert space of states by verifying the commutation relations. And uh, the field operator transforms in the way like a scalar field operator has to transform by this way, namely. And now we can go on with two more properties. The fourth property is uh, basically a corollary of the third one. If you apply a Fourier transformation or a look at Fourier modes, let's say this may be the better way to look at it, uh, in three, look at this equation, please. U dagger phi u is equal to phi with some arguments. Now you imagine that the phi is actually a Fourier integral. Who remembers how this Fourier integral looks like? Are you all able to picture it? 
in your mind? It seems not to be the case. Okay, that is important. Our measure dp uh, tilde e to the minus i p x a sub p plus e to the plus i p x a sub p dagger. That is the Fourier representation of our field operator in terms of creation and annihilation operators who, which satisfy the usual commutational relations for a, A's and A deckers. Okay, this goes here. I now read off the Fourier mode in front of one particular e to the IPX term. Because the equation must be valid for each Fourier mode on its own. And then without any other calculation, we can immediately obtain uh, what we get if we do a commutation relation of the momentum operator P mu with a dagger of P, right? Because we know what is the commutator of P with the field. So by reading of Fourier modes, we know what is the commutation relation with a dagger. So here we would get the derivative. If we get the derivative here, we get a P mu in front, where P mu is the variable here, the same P as in the argument. Therefore, we get here small P mu times a dagger of P. Where this P is a number, a number variable, uh, which is the same as the argument. That big P mu is the operator acting on our Hilbert space of states. That is also an operator, so we have a commutation relation between a creation operator and the momentum operator. Gives the creation operator times a number. That tells us what particles are created by this A dagger, namely the action of A dagger increases the momentum of your state by small p mu. That means the particles which are created by this thing have the momentum p mu. Where p vector is written here and the zero component, small p mu, is as always an abbreviation for a p square plus m square. So the particles created by this have an energy momentum relationship p square equal m square, such that m square is the rest mass of those particles. That is an automatic consequence of this. And similarly, uh, we can also look at this u dagger phi u, and here it's easier to do without translations, u of lambda, without translations, dagger times a dagger of p times u of lambda. Uh, 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 sorry, let's do it correctly. Lambda p. So in the same way on the left hand side we have always an additional lambda, u dagger of lambda, a of lambda p, u of lambda is given by a dagger of p. So you can Lorentz transform your a daggers and uh, that tells you something about the Lorentz transformation properties of the states which are created by a dagger. So and that is just a, a basically equivalent to this point three. But now we can apply it to answer all our questions on the particles. So if we have, for example, a one particle state P, small p, which is a one particle state defined by acting with a dagger onto the vacuum then we get one of those important one particle states in our quantum theory that we have constructed. And uh, now we can answer what are the properties of those one particle states. In other words, what are the properties of our particles that the theory contains. So this is a one particle state. And uh, by the way, to connect it to our Poincaré discussion in general, here there is no index S, which we had in the general discussion of one particle states. There just isn't such an index in our theory, so our one particle states are just labeled by a momentum argument coming from this A dagger of P. 
okay, now what are the properties of those states? If we act on them with the momentum operator, capital P, which is this operator here, then we go to this commutation relation and we imagine that this P is given by a dagger acting onto the vacuum. So we use the commutator of P and uh, a dagger. Then we flip the order. Then afterwards P acts onto the vacuum. That gives zero. And so we get exactly the eigenvalue small p mu times the same state P. That means our states created in this way are actually momentum eigenstates with the momentum small p mu, where p square is equal to m square. So we learn that we have particles in our theory with rest mass m. Then from here, we learn something about the Lorentz transformation property. If we act with u of lambda onto our state p, then what do we get? From here, you can flip the order a little bit, and then you see that you just get the state with the momentum lambda p. And so here there is no uh, additional degree of freedom, no index s. And so for example, if you do the last equation in the rest frame, then you can apply a rotation. Let's say this is just a rotation. onto the particle at rest, particle at rest. Then what do you get? You get the same state where the momentum is rotated, but if the particle is at rest, you get the same state back again. No change by this Lorentz transformation. That means your state for the particle at rest is completely Lorentz invariant. And uh, this is the same as identity plus angular momentum operators. Therefore, it means the angular momentum operators map that state to zero. So that is equivalent to saying j x y z or j vector acting on the state at rest is zero. This statement means the particle has been zero. So and with this, I would summarize, because now, if I see it correctly, we have determined all the physics results that we need in order to interpret our theory. And the conclusion is, this theory that we have constructed in this way is a consistent relativistic quantum theory, which describes relativistic uh, because of this unitary representation, u of lambda and a, bosonic, because of these commutation rules, a dagger, a dagger commutator is equal to zero. So the states are completely symmetric in all the particle indices. Spin zero particles been zero because of the last relationship with rest mass m. And the field operator phi of x necessarily combines a and a dagger, which is a decisive difference to the non-relativistic case of the Schrödinger field, which gives already this indication that in a relativistic theory, particle number might not be conserved. So that is our final result for the interpretation of that theory. And let me just add one single additional line, which fits here. Just as a summary, we have in the end one real 
field operator phi of x and we see in this way that this corresponds to one particle type with spin zero, which means one degree of freedom for our particle maps to one degree of freedom in our field description. Okay. This finishes our discussion of the quantization of the real scalar field and uh, we have obtained a very complete uh, picture and a complete result and uh, even though we did not carry out all the detailed calculation uh, up to the very end, I hope that the indications are sufficient for you to see the full logical connection from the basic definition of the theory with the Lagrangian down to all these conclusions and you should be able to fill in all the details if you like to, to calculate all the necessary commutation relations which are the basis of those fundamental conclusions. And of course, this is the blueprint for the more complicated cases. And let me just say what the next cases will be. The next case will be the complex scalar field, which is not very much different from this one. And uh, then uh, the Dirac field where we get spin one half and afterwards a spin one field like the photon field or a field for a massive spin one particle like the W and Z boson. So this will be the order in which we will discuss it. But in each case, we can go through uh, the basically identical sequence of steps and come up with identical uh, sets of conclusions in a systematic way. But the higher we go in spin, the more complications we will meet along the way. But uh, the logic will nevertheless remain basically this one. Okay, with this let me stop and uh, wish you a nice next week and then we see each other in two weeks from now on the Monday.